You ever learn something and think to yourself, hmm, that's pretty interesting. I'd like to share that with people. That's what this video is. I would like to talk about three movies. The first one is The Computer War Tennis Shoes. This movie came out in 1969 and stars Kurt Russell, who after an accident in a computer lab, basically becomes a walking computer. Now if this movie sounds familiar, I did mention it in my Guessing the Plots to Old Disney Movies video I did a couple months ago back when Disney Plus came out, but I had not actually seen this movie at that time. The second movie is Now You See Him, Now You Don't. This movie came out in 1972 and stars Kurt Russell, who after an accident in the chemistry lab creates an invisibility potion. The third movie is The Strongest Man in the World. This movie came out in 1975 and stars Kurt Russell, who after an accident in the chemistry lab creates a super strength formula. Now there's a lot that I want to get into regarding these three movies, but the first similarity that'll jump out at you is that they all star Kurt Russell. Now, on its own, that's nothing crazy. I mean, actors appear in different movies, especially an actor as prolific as Kurt Russell. But these movies all fall into a specific time in Kurt Russell's acting career. Now, my apologies to anyone who's old enough to remember Kurt Russell's early acting career, but I imagine that the Venn diagram of those people and people who can access the internet are two circles that don't overlap. Before he was Ego in Guardians of the Galaxy, before he was Mr. Nobody in the Fast and Furious franchise, before he was Steve Stronghold in Sky High, Kurt Russell was a teen actor and one of Disney's biggest stars. His first Disney project was a movie called Follow Me Boys, where he was only 13 years old when he started working on it. Shortly after this project, he was offered a 10-year deal to exclusively make movies for Walt Disney Studios. And it wasn't too long after this that he was considered Disney's biggest star at the time. So at some point pretty early on into his Disney career, Kurt Russell actually ended up befriending Walt Disney himself. And I don't know why, I can't prove it, but for some reason I think they might have played ping pong together. After that, you signed a 10-year contract with Walt Disney and you actually got to know him a little bit. What was that like? Yeah, we used to play ping pong at lunch really? together some of the time. Uh, we played ping pong together a lot. We used to play ping pong with Walt Disney, does that count? Now this is just an interesting bit of trivia, sure, but then it gets a little weirder when you realize that the last recorded footage of Walt Disney before he died was of Disney promoting a movie that stars Kurt Russell saying how much you're gonna like our new star, Kurt Russell. And uh, oh yes, you're about to meet a 15 year old boy for whom I predict a great acting future. His name is Kurt Russell. And if that wasn't weird enough, Walt Disney's last words before he died were writing Kurt Russell's name on a piece of paper. Now, I don't know that anyone's ever definitively said what this note of just Kurt Russell's name might mean. I think the agreed upon answer is that he was just jotting some idea down that Kurt Russell would be a good fit for. But I would propose maybe he was writing down the name of the guy who poisoned him and left him to die. I don't know. So no, these movies don't just all star Kurt Russell. They all star Walt Disney's hand-picked teen actor to fulfill the prophecy of making Disney millions of dollars. Now something else you might not guess from these movies, just based on the titles alone, is that these movies are actually part of a trilogy, often referred to as the Dexter Riley trilogy, because Kurt Russell plays a character named Dexter Riley. So it isn't just Kurt Russell who appears in all these movies, you also have Joe Flynn who plays Dean Higgins, the dean of the college that all these movies are set in, and Cesar Romero who plays A.J. Arno, the businessman turned crook who's the bad guy in all these movies. If you didn't guess this isn't a trilogy, I wouldn't blame yourself. I mean, we're used to the standard naming convention of a trilogy being that there's a movie name, then there's movie name number two, and movie name number three. I'm also not convinced that anyone working on these movies knew it was a trilogy. I mean, if you look at the box art for the collection set, the movies aren't even in the right order. I'm also not sure that any of the characters in these movies watched the movie that came prior to it. At the end of the first movie, Kurt Russell and all of his friends win the college knowledge competition, which comes with a $100,000 grand prize that goes to their school. The second movie starts with Dean Higgins simultaneously complaining that the school is out of money and Kurt Russell and his friends are a bunch of degenerates. Actually, he calls them ne'er-do-wells a few times, and that's a good word. I think we should bring it back. Now, um, Quigley, we do have certain ne'er-do-wells that must be seen to. But that's just one of the many, many inconsistencies in this trilogy. One of the most apparent ones, if you watch all these movies back to back, is Kurt Russell's group of friends. First of all, he has so many friends. I feel like for most movies we're used to having a protagonist and then they have maybe one or two partners or sidekicks that they work with, but in these movies he has like 15 friends who all just roam around and often all speak at the same time. Just 
one minute. What you'll notice though is that this group just changes from movie to movie to movie. Even Kurt Russell's girlfriend, if it is his girlfriend, I think they hold hands finally in the third movie, she changes in all three movies. I know these movies are like 50 years old, but if Kevin Feige can make 23 movies all in one cinematic universe with pretty airtight continuity, then why couldn't Disney find someone who could just make a consistent trilogy? You could even argue that all of these movies are just a soft reboot of the one that came before it because none of the consequences carry through to the next movie. Again, towards the end of the first movie, there's a chase scene where Cesar Romero pulls out a gun and starts shooting at Kurt Russell and his friends. Luckily, they're armed with not one, not two, but three wooden ladders that they can return fire with, so they end up being okay. But then when Cesar Romero shows up at the beginning of the second movie, Kurt Russell's like, I thought you were supposed to be in jail. We thought you were in jail. And he's like, yeah, I was, but now I'm not anymore. Oh, that. <laughs> well, that was a mistake. You know, the police, judges, they all make mistakes. But I forgive them. I don't hold any grudges against anyone. And then Kurt Russell doesn't say, yeah, but you were shooting at me and my friends with a gun. I think you should be in jail. Hey, what's going on around here? Now, trilogies are common enough, but would you believe me if I told you? that these movies are also part of a cinematic universe. That's right, these movies are part of the MCU, the Medfield College Universe. This cinematic universe includes movies such as The Absent-Minded Professor, Flubber, Son of Flubber, The Shaggy Dog, and The Shaggy DA, although the last two take place in the town of Medfield, not the college itself. And a quick note about Medfield College, it's the most high school college I've ever seen on film. There's Students getting bullied and having their homework taken, people are using lockers, everyone's on a first name basis with the dean of the college. Good morning, Dean. No, no, good morning. Good morning, Dean Higgins. Good morning, Dean Higgins. Oh, Hi, Dean. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This isn't something I often brag about because it's not something to brag about, but I've been to three different schools over the course of my college career, and I couldn't tell you the name, age, race, or gender of any of the deans at any of those colleges. The final point I want to make about all these movies is that they're all just the same movie. So many of the plot points happen in at least two, if not all three of these movies. They all have the same opening scene, two of which are shot almost identically, where Dean Higgins is complaining that the school is out of money and somehow it's the student's fault, even though I'm pretty sure they already paid their tuition. Then some sort of accident happens. In two cases, it's lightning striking the college. which then leads to Kurt Russell gaining some superhuman ability. Then there's a scene of Kurt Russell learning he has this ability and testing it out, and honestly, nobody around him is all that shocked that he now has this superhuman ability. Dexter, how'd you do that? scientific discovery was made that would change the course of history forever, and nobody really cares that much. Then we learn about some sort of college competition with a cash prize that's in the exact amount of money that the school needs, and Kurt Russell's newfound superhuman ability now gives him a distinct advantage to win that competition. In The Computer War Tennis Shoes, it's a college knowledge competition. You know, they're the people who sponsor the college knowledge program. The quiz program where they ask the questions from the encyclopedia and they give away a hundred thousand dollars? In The Strongest Man in the World, it's a college v college liftoff where they're both sponsored by serial companies. Yeah, these movies get weird, I don't know. And in Now You See Him, Now You Don't, it's a, well, it's just a generic science fair. But in order to get into the science fair, Dean Higgins needs to play a round of golf to impress the guy who runs the science fair. So Kurt Russell makes himself invisible and helps Dean Higgins score an absurdly low score on this golf course. So yeah, that one's a little different, but equally stupid. Then eventually, A.J. Arno catches wind of this newfound ability that Kurt Russell has, and in one way or another tries to steal it. 
In one case, he just kidnaps Kurt Russell. Someone makes a very specific and dated reference. You know, it's a great idea doing something for the school, but next time, let's do something easy, like hijacking a Cuban airline. Yeah. That did appear to be easy. Alright, that only really happened in one movie, but I had to include it somewhere. Someone ends up going to jail, but they get bailed out for $100. Well, the bail for Dexter Ryler is $100. I'm sorry about the bail money. Oh, sorry. Sorry doesn't feed the bulldog, and you're paying me that money back. $100. There's a car chase. <laughs> Eventually, we get to the final moments of whatever the college competition is in that particular movie. Kurt Russell shows up, but he's unable to use his newfound superhuman ability to help him win this until the very last second where he's able to pull out a W. Lebanon, Kansas. That is absolutely correct, and Medfield wins the $100,000 prize! Yeah! If you look at the writing credits for these movies, you'll notice one name in all three of them. Joseph L. McEvity. Mc... McEvity. Whatever. He's the sole writer in the first movie, and it's him and some other guy in the second and third movie. I genuinely think that when it came to these sequels, they just handed a new writer the original script for the computer wore tennis shoes and said, just change it enough so the teacher doesn't know that we copied each other. And then just credited both writers. So yeah, that's the strange rabbit hole that I found myself in once I watched one of these movies and learned that there was two others that were technically sequels, but also part of a cinematic universe with other Disney movies, even though they're all just the same plot written by the same guy who got paid three times to write one script. And they all star child actor Kurt Russell, who I'm pretty sure I implied killed Walt Disney. I don't know. The more I looked into these movies, the stranger things got. If you have any interest in watching these movies, which I wouldn't recommend, two of them are on Disney+, Plus, which is strange. I don't know why Now You See Him, Now You Don't isn't, but you can rent that one on Amazon like I did, like a chump. Or if you prefer just watching people talk about movies in general, then maybe check out the Big Movie Boys podcast. It's a podcast I just launched a couple weeks ago with a few of my friends. At the time that this is coming out, we have two episodes already, as well as a bonus video on our YouTube channel. Maybe give that one a shot so you can get a taste of what the podcast is all about, and maybe you'll see if you like it. I'll put all the links for that below in the description. In any case, why not hit subscribe on this channel? And I'm going to go back to watching terrible movies.